Hi, uh, this is the uh, final public meeting of uh, this year. Uh, as you know, there are the guidelines, uh, I'm sorry, the ETPA law is, uh, has been extended uh, for five days, so we're within the five day period that the legislature uh, extended it uh, so we can take action as we plan to do tonight. Uh, tonight's meeting is for the rebuttals by the owner members and the tenant members. They get 10 minutes each by prior agreement. Uh, the tenant members are going to go first. And uh, <coughs> then we'll take a very brief uh, recess and come back and have the motions and discussion on what the actual guidelines uh, will be. So let me just introduce the board members who are here. She's um, here. Belina's here. Um, I don't know if she's right in a second. Okay. Uh, Genevieve Grosch is a tenant member. Reverend Emma Jean Lawson Woods, tenant member. Elsa Rubin, public member. Jane Morgan Stern, public member. Michael Rosenblatt, public member. Amy Barnes, public member. Elliot Tristan, owner member. And Ken Finger, uh, owner member. Colleen Aqua is here. I guess she just stepped away for a couple of minutes, but I'm sure she'll be joining us uh, very shortly. Uh, Chuck? Well, okay, and here comes Colleen. I don't, if Chuck has any, do you have anything that you would like to uh, say to the board? Uh, you have you said have it all, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, and last but not, definitely not least, is our court reporter, Lynn Farrell. We were hoping to get a chance to see her this year, and here she is. So, uh, welcome, Lynn. And without further ado, uh, unless I forgot something, we will ask um, the tenant representatives on the board to begin their uh, ten minute rebuttal to what was uh, offered by the owners last week. <coughs> where well over half 
of Westchester residents living in poverty reside. So let's turn to what effect the owners proposed and totally unjustified increases will have on owner revenues at the expense of rent stabilized tenants. First and foremost, I want to emphasize that the numbers in my calculation are based on the voluntary survey responses submitted by owners to the DHCR. The response rate this year is less than 60%. The numbers aren't audited, they're not based on tax records, and there are no consequences for an owner failing to return a survey. I think it is fair to infer that if 40% of owners unaccounted for four were not making a significant profit, they would be quick to submit surveys to prove that. Indeed, I would argue that the lack of responses by and large undercut their arguments for any increase. Second, owners insist that regulated rents must cover dollar for dollar any increase in expenses, in essence a quid pro quo formula, but there is no such formula, formula inherent in the law, and in fact, such a formula would subvert the intent of the law, particularly where the current law allows for significant increases for vacancy allowances and decontrol that generate income that more than covers any increase in expenses. Moreover, as I have repeatedly argued, the discussion of individual categories of expenses is irrelevant outside the context of net operating profit. 2014's income is up, and last year's rent increases, like those in the year before and the year before that, were well above what was necessary to maintain consistent net operating profit better than 33%. The owner board reps keep saying they're entitled to a fair profit, and they also insist that they can't cover their expenses without an increase. And, and, and according to the landlord rep, they are only making a quote-unquote minimal um, amount of profit. Really? Even when including the market rate revenues from deregulated apartments? And is it the case that what the landlords really want to do is insulate their significant added revenues from vacancy allowances and and shift the entire burden of any increase in expenses completely onto current regulated tenants. Doing so would explicitly run counter to the mandate in the law for the board to help preserve affordable housing. Turning now to additional revenues from proposed increases. So although we're dealing with undoubtedly understated survey numbers, even using those numbers show that a rent, increase, rent freeze is warranted this year. And second, the numbers show how recent increases have escalated the number of apartments leaving the system and have decreased the number of affordable units available for under $1,000 a month. So if you turn to the, the, the two handouts that I've um, passed out, based on HUD's registrations as of June 15, 2015, and June 4, 2014, there has been a loss of another 5% of units renting for under $1,000 a month. That's 434 fewer affordable apartments. Conversely, there are an additional 616 units renting above $1,500 a month. The number of rent-stabilized units renting above $2,500 a month went up 30% year over year. And a full 28% of all rent-stabilized units are now above $1,500 a month and only one bit vacancy away from deep control. So, as I've often said, each and every fraction of a percentage increase this board passes pushes more apartments out of the system and more apartments out of the range of affordability for those now paying less than $1,000 a month. Looking at the handout showing the effect of the owner proposed increases, at those rates of 4 and 6 percent, the owners would reap an additional 14 to $30 million just from the proposed rent guideline increases not including the 14 to 24 million dollars to be realized on the 758 units to be deregulated, nor including the additional revenues of approximately 10 million on vacancy allowances. And yet, according to the owners, any and all increases in expenses without factoring in the effect of those expenses on total NOI, they believe must be covered by increases to the rent guidelines that regulated tenants should pay. One landlord even testified that they were, quote, subsidizing the lifestyles of other people. First, rent regulation is not a subsidy. It's a regulation to protect tenants when a shortage of affordable housing and vacancies can lead to gouging, and whose purpose is to simulate a normal economy but for the housing shortage. And quite frankly, 
It sounds to me, with your arguments of dollar-for-dollar dollar matching of expenses with rent increases, they are the ones who are looking to be subsidized so that revenues they obtain on vacancy allowances and decontrol can remain sacrosanct and insulated as pure profit. There is no need for an increase, and to vote for one tips the scale decidedly away from the balance the board is mandated to preserve. Turning to the fixed dollar increases, or the $40 and $60 minimum. According to Hutch registrations, there were only 8,051 units renting for less than $1,000. Last year, that number was 84.85, a loss of another 5%, following the previous year's 5% contraction from 9,000 units. These 8,000 remaining units represent only 6.4% of the total rental apartments in Westchester County. And yet it is from these 6% of tenants the owners want to extract an additional 3.86 to $5.8 million. These are the very people the law was designed to protect. I think it would be fair to say that those 8,000 tenants are more in need of that four to $6 million than the owners are. Owners who will still reap 33% net operating profit, even if we freeze rents this year. In addition, I thought this board had decided a few years ago that we would not be enacting any more core taxes on rent stabilized tenants, renting at the lower end of the spectrum, as it unnecessarily contracts the number of affordable units and takes those monies out of local communities where it can be better spent on other living expenses besides rent. Finally, I want to address just a couple of other erroneous arguments proffered by the owners. Um, with respect to the PIOC and commensurate formula, this has been addressed in my materials at tab A. I just want to underscore this since Mr. Finger raised it in his presentation. There has been ap ample testimony in prior years as to why this is no longer a credible or valid formula to use as it overstates costs. Using the CPI is not accurate as it reflects prices, not actual expenditures. It is not fact-based and has been rejected by the DHCR statisticians, including our own Mr. Alba and Mr. Horowitz. I also want to emphasize address the specter of landlords bailing out on their buildings due to the failure to enact uh, adequate increases. Um, as owners conceive rental property as a long-term investment, and which one owner compared to stocks. And given the current seller's market, it would be safe to say that any consummated sales are locking into skyrocketing values. Um, and this is just as a Tribeca. I've attached two articles in my materials about the increasing value of rental buildings, even those rent stabilized. Just last month, Chase put, up, put on the market a of 13 billion buildings in the Bronx, 90% which are rent stabilized, asking $90 million. Uh, in conclusion, there is absolutely no need this year to enact any increase, given past increases that were highly necessary, consistent net operating profit levels, even without factoring in rent increases, and without even taking into account the other 40% of apartments not included in the survey, and without accounting for the revenues attributable to vacancy rules. We cannot limit rent, in and rent increases to every quarter of a century. It is the board's duty in the face of reasonable returns to freeze rents this year and preserve the remaining units of affordable housing in the system.
As you may or may not know, I have served on this board from 2000 to 2011. I came to the board as a new member with our current chair, Ms. Morgan Stern. During my three-year absence, there were numerous changes both in the composition of the board and its procedures. When I last served on the board, we did not have formal presentations like last week or rebuttals and voting uh, as we're doing tonight. Most of the public members of the board were not on the board when I left. As such, you do not know much about me, and alas, I do not know much about you. I'd like to take a few minutes in my presentation to acquaint the new and old members with my background because my remarks are not based upon internet searches, statistics, or newspaper articles. They are based on my personal experience. I'm a senior partner in the law firm based in Forest Hills with 22 attorneys and full-time staff of 49. I have been practicing law for over 35 years, I can't believe it, and I have been legal counsel to the Bronx Manhattan Association Realtors for over 25 years. Many members of the Bronx Association also live in Westchester County. My, main, my firm's main focus is real estate related litigation in New York City, Westchester, and Long Island. We practice in the New York City housing courts, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, and even Staten Island sometimes, every day of the week. Although we represent some of the largest owners and management companies in New York City, many of our clients are small owners of the typical six-story brick apartment building so prevalent in New York metro area, including Westchester. Almost all of these buildings were built prior to World War II, and they are, many are near 100 years old. By and large, they are all subject to ETPA. Though the majority of our practice is in New York City, we also have a significant practice in Westchester County probably because I'm one of the few attorneys in my firm who actually lives in Westchester since 1987. I've been personally appearing in the Westchester courts since 1979, representing mostly owners but tenants too in the following municipalities. Yonkers, Mount Vernon, where I've personally worked with Mr. Hannity on a number of cases, and I can tell you that to the best of my recollection, we amicably settled and worked with mutual respect on every case without an eviction or even a trial. I've also appeared in New Rochelle, White Plains, Port Chester, Tucker, Stars, Little Greenberg, Armand, Bronxville, Largemont, Yorktown Heights, Rye, Hastings, Stops, Ferry, and Odds. I'm trying to, I know I'm on fast. As we all know, most of the ETPA buildings are in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, Port Chester, and White Plains. There is very, very little difference between representing owners in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Yonkers, and Mount Vernon, which have the highest number of buildings. Throughout Westchester County, there are buildings owned by large owners like Urban American. However, most of the buildings are not owned by large corporate owners. They are owned by small companies and families who have invested in these buildings to provide a decent living for themselves and their often multi-generational families. These owners are not interested in keeping the buildings for a few years and selling, as we have heard alleged, for short-term gain or get rich quick profits. For these small family-owned businesses, money is collected from rent as the source of funds and profits. We're not talking about huge REITs, which is a real estate investment trust, which uses large trust and pension funds from California and, and all over the country and the world to invest in New York real estate. Are the buildings in the New York metro area that are owned by large investment funds? Yes, but the overwhelming majority of them are concentrated in Manhattan south of 96th Street and lately the White Hot Market in Brooklyn. However, these large investment companies are not purchasing buildings in Lower Westchester. I know this from personal experience. The only large investment company purchases in Westchester County have been part of large packages of buildings, mostly in New York City, which require them, as part of the package, to also purchase the buildings in Westchester as part of the deal. These large companies do not seek out ETPA buildings in Westchester County. For these large companies, and REITs, trust, it simply does not make economic sense to make investments in Westchester that will be less lucrative and do not conform to their business model. They'd rather stay in Brooklyn and uh, Lower Manhattan. I'd like to share with you some lessons learned from my experience practicing in the courts of New York and Westchester for a quarter of a century. Tenants of ETA buildings are not being evicted en masse, despite stories to the contrary. One of the many reasons for this is that social service agencies in the city and Westchester have dramatically increased financial grants and assistance in order to keep families in their homes and reduce homelessness. The number of cases brought against tenants for non-payment of rent in both the city and Westchester has dramatically declined over the past three or four years. The number of cases brought in the New York City Housing Court is down over 20 percent. 
I know this because I see it in the courts and our own firm statistics and speaking with the uh, court administrative judges. The courts are now eerily devoid of the hubbub of just a few years ago. The average rent in ETA building in Yonkers and other simi similar municipalities is nowhere near the threshold to take them out of ETPA. We constantly hear that the uh, vacancy is going to go to 2,500 and then it goes to decontrol. I personally cannot think of one apartment owned by any of our clients in ETPA buildings that is anywhere close to the $2,500 threshold. The overwhelming majority of rents are still below $1,000 and some substantially below. There's a fallacy even with testimony uh, from the tenant representative vacancy and decontrol is driving out working families. It's simply not the case. As you have heard, um, that nearly 100% of the cost to owners are completely beyond the owner's control, taxes, water, insurance, fuel, etc. The one cost that owners do have some control over is, of course, repairs and rehabilitation. With many, many buildings well over 50 years old, repairs and rehabilitation is an absolute requirement. You have heard from a number of tenants about the bad conditions in their apartments. None of my clients, and certainly owners in general, want their buildings to fall into disrepair. Well, it may be the tenants are reporting poor living conditions in their apartments. As many of us know, repairs can be timely, and sometimes the extent of repairs needed is exaggerated. Why would a landlord wish for his building to fall into a disrepair, state of disrepair? Isn't a building in good condition more valuable than one that is in poor condition? That said, given the variability and flexibility that owners have in negotiating the cost of services, it makes economic sense for an owner to maximize cost savings by lowering costs related to repairs. An owner maximizes profits by repairing building malfunctions and keeping his building in good condition, but also by doing so with the lowest cost related to that repairment. It's simple economics. So why is it that we constantly heard that owners won't repair buildings to increase profits? Simply put, it sounds good when making arguments to justify votes against guideline increases in order to offset the rising costs or politicians seeking votes to stay on the public payroll. We only have to look around us locally to see the folly of not properly maintaining structures and capital investments. Just take a ride down I-287 West. New York State built the Tappan Zee Bridge only 50 years ago, just 50 years ago. Due to New York's failure to properly maintain that bridge through the years, the state's taxpayers are now funding a $4 billion, with a B, billion dollar replacement bridge. How much could the taxpayers have saved if New York State maintained the original bridge like the George Washington, Brooklyn, or Triborough bridges? Just to name a few. Maintenance of apartment buildings is really not that different. Built of concrete and steel, they're subject to the same aging and depreciation process. Uh, I'm skip through things. Well, unfortunately, many of our landlords are not as neglectful as the New York State Thruway Authority. Their willingness to respond readily to repair issues is in their own best interest. That is why we're recommending to the board that they enact an increase that will allow all owners to have required funds to continue upgrading and make repairs as required. Uh, go through that. One minute left. Yeah, okay. Well, just about large apartments, very quickly, Section 8 is forcing underutilized apartments, the tenants, if they, you know, people have moved away, to move to lower, uh, smaller apartments, uh, and uh, if they don't, they lose their thing. Succession is a big problem. We haven't talked about it. Um, but, uh, preferential rents, that's why a lot of it. Uh, Ms. Tamara Stewart, a tenant in Mount Vernon, who eloquently spoke to all of us, at the public hearings in Yonkers, I've heard Mike Plains commented that maybe there should be different guidelines for small versus large buildings. Small building owners should get more money. Small owners should not get a zero guideline because there is less term. Let us put aside all of the rhetoric and hysteria of politicians merely seeking to be reelected to office and consider instead a rational review of all of the circumstances of the real world by enacting a sensible guideline increase of 4%, 6%, Minimum forty and sixty dollars for two year renewals. I'm out of breath. And out of time. <coughs> Come back and I will entertain 
motions uh, for rent guidelines for this year. Show of hands, or do you want to? No, no, I, I, we're going to do it by uh, rolling the board, the roll roll. Okay. Thank you. Um, Elsa Rubin? No. Belene Aqua? No. Eddie Mae Barnes? No. Elliot Cherson? Yes. Michael Rosenblatt? No. Genevieve Roach? No. Reverend Emma Jean Lofton Woods? No. Kenneth Finger? Yes. Chair doesn't need to vote. Uh, two votes in the affirmative and six votes in the negative. Okay, the motion fails. Uh, do I hear another motion? Yes. Reverend Walton Woods? For a one year lease, I'd like to motion 1.75. Sir, can you speak up, please? No. no, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. For a one year lease, a zero increase. For a two year lease, a zero increase. I second the motion. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Board members? No discussion? Call Roll call Elsa Rubin? No. Belene Aqua? No. Eddie Mae Barnes? No. Elliot Cherson? No. Michael Rosenblatt? No. Genevieve Roach? Yes. Reverend Emma Jean Lofton Woods? Yes. Kenneth Finger? No. And the chair once again does not need to vote. Again, two votes in the affirmative, six votes in the negative. Aqua? Yes. Eddie Mae Barnes? Yes. 
Elliot Shearson? Yes. Michael Rosenblatt? Yes. Genevieve Roach? No. Emma Jean, Reverend Evan Jean Lofton Woods? No. Uh, Kenneth I Finger? I think that, was that was a no? That was a no. Uh, Kenneth Finger? Yes. Uh, and the chair again does not need to vote. The motion passes six to two to zero. Eddie Mae Barnes? Yes. Elliot Cherson? Yes. Michael Rosenblatt? Yes. Genevieve Roach? No. Reverend Emma Jean Lofton Woods? No. Kenneth Finger? Yes. Jane Morganson? Oh, you don't vote. So six to two, and um, the chair is not voting. Okay. Okay. Mr. Rosenblatt, we'd like to make a statement to Based on what Mr. Finger had said, Heat and hot water. Traditionally, it's been if the tenant supplies his own heat or hot water. Louder, louder. The tenant supplies his or her own heat or hot water, not heat and hot water. If you're just supplying hot water, you still cover it. Okay. It's not and, it's or. I take, I stand corrected, I didn't know that. No. We've done it for years. But I do that, I'm not. Okay. That's it. Thank you all very much. Uh, I've seen you with a number of, of public hearings and meetings.
meetings this year. I just want to know, let you know we don't we, we don't have a date yet, but we are going to uh, meet. The board will be meeting again, of course, in public uh, to certify the guidelines in September, uh, and you will be apprised of the date in, in, uh, in due course.